ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, Mike Mongo, astronaut teacher. Oh my gosh, you made it. You made it to the greatest of all shows on earth. And you know why? Because you're here. That's what makes this show great. Not me, you, you, you. Okay, right there, you. Yes, I'm super excited to see you today. Listen, I said we had a special occasion for this episode and we certainly do. We have on this episode, none other than Dr. Cyan Proctor, world famous analog astronaut, the most famous analog astronaut in the world. And she's gonna, she's gonna explain what as analog astronaut is. She's gonna tell us all about it. She's gonna tell you, you, you are smart enough to be here today. That means that you are on your way to living, working, and playing in space. That's why I do this. Just so that you know, so that you who are putting in the effort know that you have permission to live, work, and play in space. My Google, this excites me. Okay, so we've had a lot go on since Friday. It's Monday. Monday is a fine day. You know, let's turn on these lights. Lights, action, camera. This morning, Dr. Cyan Proctor and I got up early and put together the interview so that, so that we would be there for you so that you have this information. Cyan Proctor and I have been friends for several years and she gets to go and she has a television show on the Science Channel called Strange Evidence, Stranger Evidence. And she was on, um, do you know the scientist Stephen Hawking? She was on Stephen, PBS's public broadcast system, PBS's uh, Genius, she was on that show. Uh, with Stephen Hawking when he was, Dr. Stephen Hawking when he was alive. And uh, I still got the light. Look at these lights. Aren't they awesome? And so I'm, I'm very excited about that. I got a lot of questions this week. And all these people are doing, are sending letters. They're sending letters to NASA. They're sending letters to Jim Bridenstine. We're going to talk more about that. An alarm. Praise Google. Praise Google. Oh yeah, listen, there's something I gotta tell you about. I gotta get this cleared up right now, right now. Remember last week when I talked about uh, centri centripetal force? Centripetal force, yes, centripetal force. Even grown-ups misspell words. And one of the best parts about being a human being is being able to make mistakes, which could be terrible except for one thing, we get to acknowledge when we make mistakes. You get to do that. Not, not when it's a, like, as, as you get to make the best mistakes because you get to make dumb mistakes. You get to make mistakes that would make a grown up quit. You get to make mistakes and recover from them. You, that's why we build schools. That's why we have the whole education system set up. It's a place for students to make mistakes. So you become a grown up who doesn't make the kind of mistakes that students make. You're learning, and learning is essential. Mistakes are an essential part of learning. There is a uh, terrific saying, there is no better teacher than experience. And sometimes we, we have to learn the hard way. And that's a, that's a tough lesson sometimes. Like, um, that's why I always tell students, if you have somebody in your life that you love them, tell them, tell them, we're not guaranteed time with anyone. We can't take for granted that someone's always gonna be there. I know people who made the mistake of not telling the person that they love, they love them. And then remembering, I wish I had said, I love you. And I got to be one of those people, my mom passed away, that means she died, several years ago. No, uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half. And we had the best time, I had the best mom. Oh my Google, I'm 55. So she had an amazing life, legendary. And I'll talk about her the rest of my life. And my son, Raphael, uh, he's got two dads, I'm one of them. He, he talks about Nana Mindy all the time. And he got to tell her that he loved her also. And that is with us, that memory 
it, that important memory is with us. And so it's important to say that, that you love the pre, lo, I love you to the people that you love. It's, it's a little thing that we can do every single day. We can, we can uh, send a letter to someone who's far away and just remind them how important they are to us. And that's why I really was, was uh, making a point of, of, uh, of having, having you learn how to write and mail a letter. These are really important skills. And even better than that, it's even better than, it, it's even better than important. Here's why it's even better than important. What's going on with this line? Oh, I forgot to put the battery in. Um, letter writing is something that people remember. Like, not just how to do it, but I've got a friend, Doug Wheelock, astronaut, NASA astronaut Doug Wheelock, and he and I were talking this morning, and, and uh, we were talking about the letters that you are, you are writing to NASA, or any of your hero, any hero that you want to write a letter to. He was talking about that. And, uh, oh, I just remember something. I better do this real quick. Let's uh, swipe this and hit that button and then swipe out and I'm back. And so what we were saying is, oh, he saves, he saves the letters that, that students send to him. He saved it and he showed it on, on Twitter this morning. He showed a letter that a six-year-old person named Ollie wrote him. I mean, how impactful must that be for a NASA space shuttle astronaut to save that letter? He wrote it in 2015. That was five years ago, and he still has that letter. Woo! Think about the impact we have on other people. And a letter has that kind of impact. So that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be the one to encourage you to write a letter. Write that letter. Write the letter you want to. Say I love you to an aunt, to a tío, to a, to a niece, to a nephew, to a grandma, to a nana, to a granny to a granny, a granddaddy, to a grampy, to a grandpa, to a granddaddy, to, to a faraway mom. Maybe, maybe your mom or your dad is in the military. Whoa, when I was in the military, well, I didn't mean to get on this topic, but when I was in the military, I want you to know that when I got letters, it was the most important thing in the world to me. So if you have somebody who's in the military, even if they're not, committed somewhere, even if they're not uh, stationed somewhere far away, even if they're stationed in the United States, getting a letter is going to make a big difference in their life. Or, holy gazad, gazad, holy great gazad, holy goodness, wait, what if you have a person who you love in your life who is a doctor or a nurse right now during the pandemic? Imagine how important a letter from you would be. Oh my gosh. It touches my heart just, just saying it to you. What's this got to do with space? Great question. And I'm happy to tell you. Here's what it has to do with space. It's really simple. These, are, these life skills that we practice in other situations besides space, ex, 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 exactly space related, build character. And character is what makes us invaluable on a team. And for everybody who wants to live, work, and play in space, we have to, we get to be great team players. You can ask uh, uh, Doug Wheelock, a great team player. You can ask Story Musgrave, great team player. You can ask Leland Melvin, great team player. Mae Jemison, great team player. Um, Nicole Stott, great team player. Uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield, amazing team player. Um, uh, Scott Kelly, Great team player. Wow. And you can be the same thing. And you know how they developed those skills? Is they did it in ways that didn't have to do with, with astronautics at all. At all. It's funny because the things we learn in other parts of life, which is why I'm saying that the things we learn in other... I got my uh, spotlight on right now. The things we learn in other parts of life are the things we use when we're training to be, to live, work, and play in space. It is not training, it is not astronautics that teaches us how to be an astronaut. It's humanautics. It's like what I call uh, the next generation of space explorers, human heirs. We're bringing our humanity to space. 
So when we are good, play, good team players, it means we're being good human beings. And it takes, a, it takes a little work to figure out how to do that. When, when, we're, when we're kids and teenagers and even young adults, we're naturally what people call selfish. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that we're very self-oriented because we're working on develop ourself. We're not full grown yet. Our human brain doesn't even finish growing until sometimes 35. So if your brain isn't fully grown, you're not a fully functioning grown up yet. Until like 35. Keep that in mind. That's important. You are, these skills that you're developing right now, regular skills, can you climb a tree? That's, an, that's a skill that, that's, that teaches um, um, coordination. Can you, can, you do, can you do multiplication in your head? That's an important skill. Do you know your times tables? These are, like I know a secret about learning timetable. Here it is. They're like a song to me. Uh, two times two is four. Three times three is nine. Four times four is 16. Uh, 16 times 16. Um, 16 times 16 is actually easy. Watch. Here's how it works. Here, I'll show you how, how I do it. Here, I'll show you. Let me bring it up on the whiteboard. Um, let me flip this camera around. Paka, 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 paka. All right, now we'll go over here. I'm going to show you how I do this. This is a cool trick. Oh, did I flip it wrong? All right. Let's put this right here. We'll get some whiteboard space. <laughs> Remember? Back. So I saved it. This is how, this is how to misspell the word. <laughs> I saved it. This is, this is how to misspell the word. In case you're not hearing me, I saw the signal got disconnected a second ago. It looks like it's back. This is how you misspell the word, all right? Centripetal. Like, this is like a, a centripede. <laughs> like, if there was a creature called a centripede, which there isn't, there's a centipede. I can show you how to do that. <sighs> centipede. And that's kind of like a caterpillar in a way. Uh, but this is not that word. This is wrong. Watch. Wrong. That's wrong. Here, here. Come on, Mike. <laughs> you really could. Centrip. Oh my gosh. Really centrip pit. Oh, you know what? I'm having a mental, a mental block on this word. And I should know it because it's actually one of my favorite words. So when I don't know a word, I, I, I do what, what we should do. I look it up. Oh, gosh. You know what is so funny? How did I forget? It's centripetal. Centra and pedal. Centripetal. Centripetal. I think that there's a Latin here. I think it means... Um, uh, force seeking, if I recall correctly, there's something about that because centripetal force is how. Let's see if uh, I can adjust it so the light's not hitting it. Just right. Centripetal force is. Let's see what we got here. I'll move things around a little bit. It's that kind of show. Centripetal force. Oh, that's light on the outside. That's fine then. Cause we love the sun. This is when, let's say, oh, you know when you have a yo-yo and you swing, it, swing the string around and the yo-yo goes, ar goes around? That's centripetal force. That's what's happening right there. It is moving away. It's actually seeking the center. It means center seeking, center seeking, centripetal. And, and, so if, and the reason we were talking about it is that you can, we can create a space station. Here, let me, let me show you how we would do it. I even have a can, which is a perfect example. And it's funny because it reminds me Oh my gosh, coffee, look, I drink coffee. Look, pop, pop, pop. This is one of my favorite go-tos, just a little easy one to grab. All right, so here is a can. Imagine this is a space station, okay? So then here would be the center of the space station. And imagine in the center of the space station, there's a core that runs all the way down the middle. Well, you know what I mean. A core, okay? There's a core that runs right down the middle. And then this spins. Imagine this is spinning. Whoa, what's happening? Don't tell me that I forgot to put a battery in the other one. Two batteries. What's going on here? Hmm. All right. So imagine this is spinning. Got it? It's spinning this way. 
Spinning, spinning, spinning. But imagine it's spinning really fast. Imagine this is a giant space station. The centripetal force is the force that throws things out to the side. So if this is a giant space station and, and people would be little tiny and it's, it was spinning like this, it was spinning really fast, it would throw everybody to the side and create artificial gravity in space. So imagine this was the size of like an Empire State Building and it was spinning in space. So that's how we and it had a, a center column that it would spin on like a shaft and then it would spin and, and throw everybody to the edge and make, we don't want to go so fast that it mashes everybody, obviously, but fast enough that it, when it was spinning, we would, be, uh, we would be able to walk around the inside of it. And that is centripetal force. That's how, that, that's how that works. There's other forces, that's one of them, and that's worth knowing. And I spelled it wrong last time, and I wanted to correct that immediately. Oh my goodness, all right. And uh, since I brought out the can of coffee, a reminder, this show is coffee powered. You can buy Mike Mongo. Oh, students, I give you permission to enroll your grown up into buying Mike a cup of coffee. By buying Mike a coffee, just go to mikemongo.com and click on buy Mike a coffee. And that's how this whole thing is funded. That's how this works. And that's how, how we move this forward and we get you living, working, and playing in space by your grown up buying me a coffee. Pow, pow, pow. All right, so now, I, I gotta get to this thing with, I gotta get to this episode, uh, this interview with Dr. Cyan Proctor. Y'all ready for this? Okay, so since uh, I'm still new to this, the whole streaming technology, deal with it, you gotta deal with it. We're gonna play it, we're gonna play it on the computer, and then what I'm gonna do is when I edit the video, I'll just paste it in there, and you'll be able to watch it, just totally smooth. But in the meantime, we're gonna do it like this, watch. I got a, I got a setup over here. Watch, it's pretty good. You're gonna dig it. I hope. I hope you dig it. All right. Now we're here at Astronaut Adventures with the most famous analog astronaut in the entire world. I cannot tell you how excited I am to say that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my great friend, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Hi, everybody. It's really great to be here and to talk to you, Mike. You're, you're the first guest on Astronaut Adventure. You're our first Yay. guest ever. Yay, I'm so excited to be here. Thank I'm you. glad to be here to share all of my adventures with everybody. Yeah, your adventures are awesome. You, you, you really do. You are one of the people alive that I know of whose adventures at least match my own. Your adventures are at least as good as mine. Oh, thanks, Mike. You know, uh, I think part of that is just having that explorer at heart wanting to get out and, and just find the answers and learn about all kinds of things that the world has to offer. Cool, so I got, I got a couple of questions for you. First of all, I want people to make sure that so they can Google you later. Cyan, S-I-A-N, Proctor. Oh, wait, I forgot something really important. I got this, I got this. I love to write, everybody <laughs> knows. I love my whiteboard so much, it is Dr. Cyan Proctor. Dr. Cyan Proctor. So are you a medical doctor? No, I am a PhD doctor. That means that I spent a lot of time going to school, learning how to teach other people about science and science education and what we call STEAM, science, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics. So Dr. Cyan Proctor, world famous analog astronaut. Now, what That's correct. Is, what does analog mean? Analog means it is a, it's analogous or similar to something else. And so you can think of when we talk about Mars and exploring Mars and the terrain of Mars, well, are there similar terrains here on Earth? And if we can find a match of a Mars terrain to an Earth terrain, we call the Earth terrain an analog to Mars. And so in space exploration, we're always looking for analogs to things that we see in our solar system, but here on Earth. So we can test those things. So you get to go on these analog astronaut missions to test what it would be like to go on a, a, a Mars mission? That's correct. And so I like to live in moon and Mars habitats. 
in locations that are very Mars-like. And so I lived in one called the High Seas Habitat, and I have a 3D model of it here. And so it was a, it's a geodesic dome like this, and I've got a picture of it in real life. Can you see that? Oh, I was gonna, it looked really small. I was wondering how you fit in it. So it's actually really big. It is actually really big, big enough to hold six people. So me and five crewmates. And so we lived in that dome for four months. But what's, what's awesome about it is that the terrain is very Mars-like, volcanic, red, just awesome. Did you wear astronaut uniforms when you went outside? I got to wear a spacesuit. And so oh. you can see my spacesuit back here. Wow. And I have my two space explorers. They come with me whenever I go on an analog mission. These are my Astro Bears. And so this is Ursa Minor, and this is Sally, Sally Bear. And so I take them with me when I go to live in these moon and Mars simulations. You're allowed to take that kind of stuff with you? Yes, because one of the things is when you're going away from home to do these kinds of things, and even astronauts, you want to bring some personal stuff that reminds you of home, that makes you still connected to the people you love and the things that you love back on Earth. Did you ever get homesick on your analog astronaut missions? Sure. I mean, everybody gets a little bit of homesick, but that's why we bring things that help us cope and really keep us connected to our family and friends back home. So one of the things, Dr. Proctor, one of the things that I have been teaching and communicating with students right now is that this quarantine that we're in because of the global pandemic is a, it parallels, it's like an analog to space mission training. How do you feel about that? I absolutely agree. It is the same kind of thing that I experienced, but we're living in the high seas habitat. You know, when we can't go outside and do some of the things that we normally do where we're in restricted environments for whatever reason, whether it's being in a spacecraft in a hostility of space or being on a ship in the ocean or living in a habitat like I did in the high seas habitat or living in your house and figuring out how to not only survive, but thrive while living in quarantine. What's the difference between surviving and thriving? Well, good question. Surviving is getting the basic needs met. So do you have enough water? Do you have food? Do you have air? Do you have shelter? Some of those things that we basic need to survive as a human. Now, if we want to thrive, though, we have to have things like community, and we have to have some things that help us connect with people, and we want to make sure that we're happy, right? And so things like this help with thriving because it helps connect me with home. Books that I bring, um, being able to email or chat with family, do virtual things with people like you, friends of mine. And so these are the things that help us thrive in this type of environment. You, you know what helps me thrive? What? Dark chocolate. <laughs> For me, it's my tea. And so I have my tea this morning. And I actually have a mug where we first met. This is Space Vision. And so... Those of you who are listening, I met Mike seven years ago at a conference all about space. For students. For students specifically, yes. The, the SEDS Space Vision Conference, which they have every year for college students. So high school, they have high school chapters of SEDS, the students yes. for the exploration and development of space. And then every year SEDS puts on the Space Vision Conference that you and I met at, at Purdue University, where Neil Armstrong went to engineering school. That's correct. And so, so it, there's many ways for students get, to, get, to get connected to space. I, I, uh, I, this, this is making me laugh because it reminds me of a couple of different things. One, it reminds me that um, I love coffee. <laughs> because you do love we, coffee. We had, co we had coffee in, together <laughs> in, in, at uh, that conference. And the other thing it reminds me is that you, that was when you first told me the story of your dad meeting Neil Armstrong. So now I got, I have a question for you because yes. you, to do all these amazing missions, you must have been born rich and famous. 
No, not at all. In fact, neither of my parents had college degrees. And so, but my father always had a love of science and mathematics and believed in the power of education and making connections and just working with people. And as a result, he got hired by NASA when he was really young, in his early 20s, to help track satellites and spacecraft. And so he ended up working for NASA for the Apollo missions from, I would say, Gemini through Apollo 13 on the island of Guam. Do Wait you know a minute. Is? You weren't born at Cape Canaveral? No, I was born on Guam. So you weren't even born by a space a space location. Your parents weren't rich and famous, and you are still the most famous analog astronaut in the world? That's How correct. How did you do that? Well, one of the things is that what was cool is that my father, they had a tracking station on Guam, and that was, so what you think about the Earth, and so when we send spacecraft up and it, those spacecraft go around the Earth, we have to have tracking stations all around so that we could monitor where that craft is and keep communication. So my father worked on that. And so I feel very fortunate that my father had this space history that I got instilled with at a young age. And my, my parents were always very supportive of me wanting to build model airplanes. Um, even now, I still, as an adult, I love to build things. So I have my Lego spaceship here with Sally Ride and a salute to women in space. Wow. And I have a big one that my brother just sent me, a big Saturn V that I haven't built I yet. I have that. Yes, I, have I that. can't wait. Have you built it yet? So my friend Andy, our friend Andy Hatch has that and he built the whole thing. Yes. And so I'm excited to take on that challenge. And so thinking about um, just my love of space and continuing to have it all around me and, you know, the things that my father instilled in me. Wow. That's terrific. That is awesome. So anybody could, anybody could get a job in space. Anybody can go. How many years of college did you do? Oh, yeah, anybody can get a job in space in any area. And that's what's great about it is because as we start to develop even more in space, we're going to need everything there, like you know. And for me, I, you know, I got my undergrad degree, for, took me four years. I have a bachelor's in science in environmental science. So I love looking at our environment. And then I went to Arizona State University to get my master's in geology. So it took me four years to get my master's in geology. And that's, yep, so now I'm up to eight years, right? And so that's all about the physical properties on earth. It's also the environment. So think about historical geology and dinosaurs and how the earth evolved. That's what I learned as a geologist. Now, what I love about getting my master's degree it was the best decision ever is because it got me my job. It got me my job as a teacher at a community college where I teach geology even to this day. Mm. And so while I was going and working at the community college, I decided to get my PhD and become Dr. Proctor. And that took me eight years. And the reason why is because I worked full time, but boy, it was worth it because after those eight years, I became Dr. Proctor, and nobody can ever take that away from me. Wait, that's 16 years of college. That's 16 years of higher education, and it was worth it. You must have started when you were 16 years old. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I, I have, so there was one question, what was it that came to my mind? Oh, I remember, none of those subjects that you studied were astronautics. So you, no. study, so you can be an astronaut without, be, without studying astronautics? Yes, you can. That's what's great about it. And so if you love science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, it doesn't matter what area you go into for that, you can become an astronaut or in space. Now, even if you're like art, art and space go together too. So anything you can think of, you can use that in space. Our friend Nicole Stott, the astronaut, she rode on the space shuttle and she's been at the International Space Station several times and she is a big proponent of space art. She 
she made you know that she made the first space art astronaut uniform yes she did and so she's so fantastic and yeah. that's one of the things that is really if you want to be an explorer, you need to be well-rounded. And so understanding some of the science and technology, but also the art and music of our world, poetry, things like that. You were just mentioning that Leland Melvin, a good friend of ours, wrote a poem recently. He read it. He read it. He read a poem. For Earth yes. Day. Oh, for Earth Day. I haven't seen it yet. I can't wait to watch it. You know, when I lived in the high seas habitat for four months, I lived in this dome for four months, I gave myself a poetry challenge and I wrote a different poem, uh, type of poem like every week. And so I have a whole set of poems that I wrote as a challenge to myself. And so those are the kinds of things of combining space and the science and the technology and all that stuff with the art and the language of and the culture of humans i'll put some of the links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes and i i and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again yes i definitely would love to come on again and maybe i can share one of my original poems or even talk about food and space, space food. food with you yes oh i gotta show you one thing uh our friend paul minta got me this for my own analog astronaut adventure Oh, that's fantastic. I love it. Now you've oh, got your you space right helmet. Here. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty simple to do an analog adventure now that we're in the pandemic. And, it absolutely is. And nobody knows better than you. <laughs> well, those are the things that so for everybody listening out there, learning to adapt to your environment and be resilient is all about being an analog astronaut and regular astronaut going up into space. That's, that's great advice. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Proctor. Cyan, you're one of my best friends. Thank you. <laughs> Same to you, Mike. And thanks everybody for listening. Can't wait to be back again. Okay, talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. Baka baka. Holy smokes, was that awesome or what? <laughs> that's so great. Dr. Cyan Proctor was the very first interview on Mike Mago's Astronaut Adventures. Mark it. And that is, that to me is one of the last things that Dr. Cyan said, uh, Dr. Proctor, you can Google her and I'll have her, I'll have her information in the show notes. So once, once a, oh, what's going on here? Gimbal? Gimbal the robot. Once, uh, once you see, once you look into Dr. Proctor, you can see how our experience in the pandemic and during coronavirus times is very much like an analog astronaut. That's what I've been saying this entire time. The whole globe is on a space mission training, is on a space training mission right now. Coronavirus pandemic has put our entire globe into a space mission training. That's what you're doing. That's why this show exists, Mike Mongo's Astronaut Adventures. And one of the things that Dr. Proctor said at the very end was about being resilient and flexible. And here in, as you know, in, as you know, in this time, things that we used to do aren't the same anymore. Like we get to wash our hands all the time. And we didn't really do that before we washed our hands, but not for 20 seconds at a time. We don't touch our face all the time when we're outside. We don't touch our eyes and our nose. These are things that are important. Did you know that on Mars, it is theorized that a portion of the soil on Mars is filled with a salt called perchlorate. And perchlorate salt is dangerously poisonous for human beings. And so if we got perchlorate, uh, the perchlorate salt soil on our gloves and touched our faces on Mars, that perchlorate, a very small amount, can kill us. So we, this is really the exact same thing. So we would disinfect before we go back in the spaceship. We would wear our spacesuit. We would go into a disinfecting chamber, an area, a quarantine area, and then we would disinfect. We would clean off all of that, and then we would step out into the uh, inside into this into the station on Mars in the future. Like my friend Alyssa Carson. She's been training. She's eight. She's the 19 year old teenager. She may be the first teenager in space. She has been training to go to Mars since she was five. 
And she knows that when to do all, she studies Mars because that's what she wants to do. She wants to be a Mars astronaut, a, Mar, a Mars explorer, a human heir on Mars. And so she studies about the geology of Mars, like Dr. Proctor is a geologist. And another, th another thing that Dr. Proctor said that was important was that, uh, because students ask me all the time, um, where do I go to school to study astronautics? And the fact of the matter is like, all of these different astronauts have different skills that they bring to being an astronaut, which is what you're gonna do, including artists. We, are good, we need artists in space. It was funny because many astronauts have said, wow, we should have sent a poet. We should have sent a poet. Because poetry is the way we describe how we perceive and experience reality. And the reality of space is so different to the ordinary human experience that to have somebody who is well equipped at describing that in poetry, a poet, is to the advantage of all of us because maybe all of us don't have the time right now to go to space. Maybe it's not accessible to all of us right now. So poets, poets make things accessible to many. We can learn about, oh, the poem that Leland Melvin re reads is called The Chilean Forest. And I'm gonna put it in the link. I'm gonna put it in the notes. He read it for Earth Day and that poem talks about, one of the lines in the poem talks about if you haven't been in a Chilean rainforest, you haven't been on earth. And so when Leland and I were talking yesterday, I said to him that that's how I feel about going underwater. Because people, people go underwater, and people who haven't been underwater haven't seen the world that is down there. Um, there is a, um, there is a, I, 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 there's this amazing video of a, of, a, of a great white shark 20 feet long that was posted this week. Let me see if I can find it. I, I was really amazed. And some people are terrified of sharks. And maybe people who are terrified of sharks shouldn't go underwater. But other people like scientists and me and, and a number of my friends, I have friends who swim with great white sharks. They know that, that oh, here we go. Ocean Ramsey. Ocean Ramsey is an oceanologist. I think she's a marine biologist and she studies sharks. So she swims with, with these big sharks. And, and uh, it can be dangerous. She has a sensitivity to it. She knows how to approach the, these creatures. And by showing these creatures the way that she does, Ocean Ramsey is able to give us, the, to get rid of the fear and even the hatred that we have towards sharks. Did you know that on earth, there's no more than 165 shark attacks, maybe 170 every year around the planet? but every year we kill nearly 200 million sharks with the different netting processes. And that's, uh, that, let's, let's say that that's how we used to do it because we get to change that. I had a, a friend, a really good friend, who made a movie called Shark Water. His name is Rob Stewart. And, he, and like, um, um, what is his name? Uh, Steve Irwin, the hawk, crocodile hunter, he died doing what he loved doing. And I always say that if you're doing what you love doing more than anything in the world, and that's how you leave, well, that's not terrible. Not that anybody wants to leave, but if you're doing what you love doing, well, isn't that the whole point of life? Like, I think that people who live their dreams and go after their dreams are thrilled and excited to be alive. There are people who are doing what they love doing and they can't, couldn't imagine doing anything else. There's people, doctors, doctors could get sick right now. Nurses, so many nurses helping people. Wow, when my mom was in the hospital, I wouldn't have made it without nurses. Nurses, and so many people I know, so many students I know study to be nurses. They want to be nurses and I am proud of them. And we're gonna have space nurses and space doctors. We, 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 have, a, we have space marine biologists because, oh, that's the Q&A time. Look, I, I learned how to shut off my watch. I'm gonna do it. Boom. Boom. Q&A time. It's interesting I just said space marine biology because um, uh, Dr. Proctor was talking about, Cyan was talking about uh, space food. And I love talking about space food with, with, uh, with Cyan. And one of the things that's going on is that we grow, we grow fruit and vegetables. We grow plants on the space station and these little, plant refrigerators, they're, they're actually like um, 
terrariums. They're very specialized. And we grow food that astronauts get to eat on the space station. And astronauts, the, like the way that Cyan was talk to, talking about, the way that Cyan was talking about bringing up the two bears, Ursa Minor and Sally Bear, to, to her analog astronaut missions, these things that connect us to being human beings and earthlings, being human beings from Earth, because I guess if you're in space, you're actually a spaceling, or like my friend Loretta Whiteside says, space kind, rather than human kind, we're space kind. So one of the things that connects us is plants. Plants. So astronauts growing plants in space is a big deal, and growing our food in space is a big deal because it's really expensive to ship stuff from the Earth. And so we're, pl we're planning on planting plants on, in space, and we're doing it, and we're successful at it. But keep this in mind. This is really interesting. How do you water plants in space if water floats? I want you to look that up. I'll put the, I'll put the answer in the show notes. You can Google it. I'll, I'll Google some. I'll put some information about, um, about, uh, about um, space plants. Okay? Space plants. Uh, you know, I do Johnny Appleseed in space, and we're sending Appleseed to space. One day, we're going to plant. We're going we're gonna to propagate those seeds at, at, at a space station, maybe at the Artemis mission that NASA's working on to have a space station at the moon. All right. So, Q&A, Q&A. I got some good questions. Questions from all over the world. Questions from all over the world. Very first. Remember last week, I said that I was going to have an address for you if you want to send me a letter. So... The address to send Mike Mongo letter, again, I'll put it in the show notes, is, is, oh, I need to write it down, right? All right, cool. I'll do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can do it real quick. Pow, pow, pow. Because I love to write. It's important to write. It's not, it's not only important, it's fun. Gosh, I love writing. And spelling. Centripetal. 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 All right. Here's the address. If you need to send me a letter, this is how you do it. All right? Send it here. Boonk, 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 boonk. And I'll put this in the show notes. This is one of my publishers, and they send me letters. So, they publish the astronaut instruction manual. And if you need to send me a letter, what? Need to? I love getting letters. Love. You can send it right here. This is in Oakland, California. That's in that's by San Francisco. I used to live there when I was at Berkeley. I used to live in Berkeley too. I love Berkeley. Love Berkeley. Love Oakland. The Bay Area. The Biggity Biggity Bay, as my friend E40 says. The Biggity Biggity. All right, so that's it. If you need to send me a letter, that's why you send me a letter, okay? You can send me a letter. I'm super, I love getting letters. And they'll forward it to me. All right, so let's see. Questions, questions, questions. I got questions. What? What? Let's see what we got here. Y'all ready for this? Okay, Raul Saran is in India, and he wrote to me, oh, I'm on lockdown in India for COVID-19. How can I write a letter? And I said, oh, that's a great question. Raul, Raul Saran, R Raul Saran. And uh, good, good question, Raul. And Raul, the, the answer to that is, you write the letter now because when we are out of quarantine, when we are out of lockdown, your letter will be well written and perfect and ready to deliver and ready to send into the mail. So if you are in lockdown and you can't get outside, write the letter now and be ready for when lockdown opens up. Super good question. Nice. All right. So that was one. Then another one was from my friend Aditya Venugopal. Aditya. And he asked me to join the International Space Society. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member of the National Space Society. The National Space Society works internationally. But you know what, Aditya? I joined the International Space Society. I joined, your, I joined your new club. Because you know, big things come from small beginnings. SEDS started with three students for exploration in space. 
students for the exploration and development of space started with three students, um, uh, Todd Holly, Peter Diamandis, and uh, Bob Richards, uh, that decided they, they wanted to create an organization of students who are dedicated to making space available for everybody. And they did. And it's been over 30 years now with SEDS. And I'm happy to serve on the board of SEDS. I'm a special to the board. I'm actually not on the board any longer. I served on the board of SEDS. I was the oldest active board member ever in SEDS. Pow, pow, pow. I went back to college just to be able to join SEDS because so many of the students that I work with go to set, belong to SEDS. I would say over 50% of the people that have ever joined or belonged SEDS went on to have careers in space and astronautics, including Jeff Bezos, my friend Jeff Bezos, who owns Blue Origin Spaceship Company. He was in SEDS. And uh, he, gave, he, he gave SEDS a big, big, big piece of money for scholarships and stuff like that a couple years back. So he supports space exploration. And when it's your turn, you can too. So one of the things that you can think about is when you're a young student is uh, either going to a school that has a SEDS chapter, starting a SEDS chapter in, when you get to high school, or um, starting a SEDS chapter at your college. You can Google it. I'll put it in the show notes. There was another question. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, my Google. Got it. Coming right up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, here we go. This is from Omar Tarshon Rojas. Omar Tarshon Rojas. I live in Tunisia, so can I send a letter to Jim Bridenstine at NASA? Oh, that's a great question, Omar. Absolutely. By the way, one of my best friends is named Omar. And... Uh, I said, I wrote back to Omar, yes, you can ask whatever question you like. You may not get the answer you want, but you will get an answer to work with. And that is how we all begin our journey. To go to space means asking the right people the right questions and following up with the right actions. And that is what Dr. Proctor meant, what Sia meant with, with uh, being flexible. We have, we, if we get an answer and it's not the answer we're looking for, we get to shift. We get to shift. We're like, okay, so because I, I know a story about Cyan. When she was younger, oh wow, this is a great story. When Dr. Proctor was younger, she was uh, when she was when she was uh, uh, when she was in high school. She found out she needed glasses, and at that time, you couldn't have glasses and be an astronaut. So it meant that her dreams of going to space were done. That's what she was thinking. And so she decided she's going to do the next thing that she wanted to do. And so she studied geology, as you heard. She studied, she studied travel. She studied photography. She studied nutrition. She studied all of these things. And then 10 years later, 10 years later, after she had been out of college, one of her friends remembered her. Oh, one of her friends contacted her from out of nowhere. Hadn't talked to her in 10 years and said, you may not remember me. I was in school with you and you always made a good impression on me. You were so generous and helpful with other people. And I read some news today and I thought of you immediately. And the news is this, NASA has come up with a new list of criteria for who can, let's get, let's get into, wow, bright lights, big city, for people who can go to space. And the new criteria says that you can wear glasses and she applied and she got, she went through it 5,000 other applicants and got into the top 16. And that's how she gets invited to do all of these amazing things. She knows a, another friend of ours, Sunita, Sunita Williams, who is a, a fantastic, uh, Sir, Sunita Williams, <laughs> who is a fantastic astronaut who is, uh, works with, works with Boeing now. Sunita is, I'm going to put her name in the, um, in the, Show notes. Sunita is working with the Boeing Starliner. She's going to be one of the next people to go to space. Excuse me, to the moon. She may be Sunita Williams, who was a NASA astronaut who was on the space shuttle, may be one of the next people to go to the moon. And so uh, she is she was the, one of the people that's, uh, that uh, Cyan got to work with. Uh, I'm telling a long story. And then um, because of all those skills that Cyan carried with her to be an astronaut, uh, that's why, excuse me, because of all the skills Cyan practiced instead of being an astronaut is why she got invited to be an astronaut because she had so many other life skills and educational, such an educational background that NASA invited her 
to practice and train. And that's why she got invited on the very first high seas analog astronaut mission. So you pursue what you love and you'll get, you'll get whatever your, your heart is after. Our heart never misleads us. So um, I think that that was all the questions this week. It seems like there was one more question. I don't want to forget anybody. Let me just take a quick look on Instagram. I'm on all these different social platforms and you all message me all over the place. And um, uh, Raul shouts out Alyssa Carson. That was nice. My Nav Kingslayer mes messaged me. All right, I th I, 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 there may be another question, but we'll, we'll get to it next week, I promise. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. Oh, once again, listen, grownups, is there grownups in the room? Students, is there a grown-up in the room? If there's not a grown-up, you, you get to let them know that there's this, there's this guy who wears his glasses upside down who you really appreciate because he's giving you permission to imagine yourself living, working, and playing in space while we are all inside during this global pandemic. And during quarantine, he has transformed your experience into a space training mission called quarantine. And that it would be really cool if we bought him a coffee. So you can go to MikeMonga.com and, uh, and send me a coffee. And that, that's really a so super awesome thing to do. And I promise, and my commitment to you, is I will do everything in my power to give you the, what you need, the necessary skills, and foster those skills, and encourage those skills in you, and give you the permission to imagine yourself living, working, and playing a space. Give you the permission to imagine yourself living, working, and playing a space. And I will do that from here on out. That is my commitment to you. Got it? Got it. Once again, thanks to, to our very first uh, Mike Mongo's Astronaut Adventures special guest, Dr. Cyan Proctor. And I'll see you, I'll see you on today's Monday. I'll see, you, I'll see you in two days. Keep up the good work in the words of my people. Pa pa pow.